Hi everyone, Gerard Scorpese, co-founder of the Hairbrain Community, bringing you Professionals Who Practice number 19. This is our special series with our friends from Pivot Point where we bring in great educators and great artists to show that no matter how experienced or no matter how great you are at your craft, constant practice is the key. Today we're with one of my favorite hairdressers, Ruth Roach. Say hello, Ruth. Hi, I'm cutting the name. I'm a little busy. <laughs> <laughs> I love Ruth because she's such a well-rounded hairdresser, cutting, styling, a uh, great educator. Today she's gonna be showing uh, a multitude of techniques, a combination of some wet cutting with the razor and some dry cutting, all on our beautiful Bridget Marie mannequin. We'll talk a little bit more about the mannequin, the tripod as we get into this, but let's get into your haircut, Ruth. Tell us what you have planned for us today. Sure. Um, well, thanks for having me, first of all. But right now, the biggest trend for 2019, as we know, is the micro bob or the French bob, French girl bob, the little bob that's shorter. It's like the new lob, you know? and women are getting more comfortable with cutting their hair shorter. So what I'm doing is I've started with this, she has a one length bob with some texture at the bottom. I've started with that and I'm gonna work the nape area in skinny and close first. So I'm working with the razor and I'm just taking diagonal sections up until the occipital. I'm using a razor because I want to create a soft edge. I really am cutting more of the surface as opposed to taking, sorry, I'm in my own way. My hair's in my lip gloss and everything's all over the place. <laughs> that beautiful straight shiny hair, Ruth. Oh. Look at that. <laughs> Shake it. All right. Get to work and stop stop messing around. So as you get back to work, I want to give some shout outs to some friends that are watching. Erica Ruiz is watching from Connecticut. Thanks, Erica. Uh, Nikki is wondering if we can have a barber sometime. Yeah, we have a lot of men's cutting, guys. If you go into our Facebook page and you click videos, we've probably got about 30 different men's cuts with some great barbers, and we'll continue to bring great barbers in in the future. Thanks for your question. What's up, Frank Mussolino? Great to see you uh, watching us and joining us. If you guys have questions for Ruth, that's incredible because she's a wonderful educator. I know she'd love to answer your questions. I have a question right off the bat. You mentioned French girl bob. Yes. And we see that term everywhere. Anybody who's paying attention to social media or Instagram, what does it mean to you? What is a French girl? Is it an aesthetic? Is it it's, an actual I, technique? I think it's an aesthetic. You know, I think French women in general have always had more of an individual style as opposed to going with the super trendy look. And when I think of French girl bob, I think of a bob that um, has some, some naturalness to it. It's um, got, it portrays a lot of confidence as far as someone wearing their hair that short with a little soft fringe. So it just has that feeling of didn't try too hard, but I'm chic, you know, and it's not about me wearing a trendy haircut. It's about me being me. Okay, so now can we talk a little bit about razor cutting? Because I noticed, you know, you, your plan is to do some dry cutting and wet cutting. You've yeah. chose wet cutting for the nape and you're using the razor. So explain the whole approach and, and what you're doing right now and why you chose the razor. Well, as you can see, it's very, very dis, uh, diffused on the edges. And I'm working, I'm gonna be doing this whole cut more from working with feeling and cutting from the gut. Um, meaning I'm going to use technique, but I'm also going to really look and see what's the hair doing and what what is it going to allow me to make it do, if that makes any sense. Yep. And so, by cutting with the razor, you can even see from the profile, if you look from the profile, how much smaller that is now. All this hair is gonna spill over it, and the bob length is gonna sit in here, but it's not gonna be a hard, heavy line. It's gonna be softer. And by working with the razor on wet hair down here, I can automatically start to create that feeling of smallness, as opposed to having it all one length with a lot of weight in the nape. So a lot of love coming in. You've got a lot of your friends and fans out there. Vicky uh, Machias is watching from San Juan Capistrano. Hey, we know that's a beautiful part of the country. We've been looking at homes out there. I want to go there. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, Jeanette uh, Nelson's watching from Louisiana. Maria Ramirez says, hello, Ruth. I've been wanting a class from you. Thanks for this. So oh. this is now, and we'll talk about that. Ruth does yeah. hands-on classes all over the world. And we'll, I'm going to we'll blow talk. dry. Okay. Just the nape area. So I'll do, I'll do a little shout outs okay? while you dry that. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, our buddy Michael Snyder says, what's up, players and pimps? Uh, <laughs> there was a question coming in. I see that you're using like a, what a lot of times people call a stick razor. Yeah. So as opposed to maybe what we see as a folding razor. Great razor. Why do you yeah. 
prefer this razor over a folding razor? I, it's what I'm comfortable with right now. And I go through phases of, I'm not comfortable with, but it's just something I'm sort of enjoying right now. And that's mm -hmm. my friend Sam Diaz razor. Yeah, so this is Sam's rotating razor, yeah. which is, you know, it's great. One of the things I like about that one is that it does move. Yeah. So you can see that rotates. So if you're just joining us, I know a lot of you are uh, just tuning in. We're coming live from New York City at uh, our home studio, Blonde & Co. We are doing number 19 in our series of professionals who practice. So the idea with this is we partner with our friends at Pivot Point. They make incredible tripods and the world's best mannequins. And if anyone is out there taking education or teaching or practicing to be the best, you know, it's undoubtedly the truth that working with these mannequins will make a huge difference. I so, love, sorry, Gerard. Go ahead, please. Yeah. All, let's hear it. I don't know how I would do half of what I do without mannequins because, and I love my pivot point mannequins. I love Bridget Marie, but yeah. there's others too. Yeah. Um, but, but You're partial to Bridget Marie. She's your girl. Yeah, I am. You know, whether it's color or cutting, trying new ideas you know, working out ideas that maybe I don't want to do on a person until I've really checked it out on, you know, someone who doesn't have an opinion. Um, it's a nice way to do that. What I'm doing right here is just working in with my shears now, and I'm going to start to go into the side a little bit in the next couple of sections. So I'm just really looking at, you can see how I left the weight behind the ear, so this technically doesn't blend, and that might freak some people out. But let it go, continue to breathe. It's all going to work out in the end. Let's talk about this because you were saying cut from the gut, you know, yeah. which is for you more visual. You're going to do dry cutting, razor cutting. Yeah. But I, you know, have, I know your history and I know you've got a really solid foundation. I know that you worked closely with Trevor Sorby earlier in your career. So, how important is it to really understand classic precision haircutting before you can even cut from the gut? It's so important because, thanks for that, Gerard. You. In order to be able to just cut a piece of hair out, you have to know why you're cutting the piece of hair out, right? Or how to create a shape. Like, even though I'm going through this visually, I basically did graduation in the nape. I created a shape working with surface cutting, but if I didn't understand how to do that technically, I wouldn't be able to do it visually. That's so you have to understand the construction and the technical approach before you can get abstract. Yes. I think that's an important message, you know, because it's so easy to lose your way and get into what a lot of times people would consider easier haircutting, chopping and picking things up. Yeah. But if you understand the shape and how to create graduation, what's the difference between square and round or whatever your language is, then when you get abstract, it makes a huge difference. Totally. All right, so I noticed now that you, you've switched to the scissor and you're working with an overlapping section. Tell us what's happening now. Yep, so now this is going to start to drop over what we did underneath. So here's my original bob. It sits about an inch and a half below the new length that I'm cutting. And I'm just going to snip over here. There we go. And I'm just coming in from the side a little bit just to really lighten out the section and make it more skinny. So what I want to do here is just get the, the hair to get smaller, but I'm doing it by just working with the, the part of the blade that's closest to the axle. Kind of like the V of the scissor? Yeah, and I'm working in there and really just barely moving them. You can see I'm not moving them that much and I'm not out here either. When you're out here and you move them just a little bit, you cut a lot more of the hair, it's more dangerous. When you work just a little bit and you're closer to here, then you're um, you're going to get a softer result and not take as much hair out. So working deep inside the V of the scissor, opening and closing without closing all the way. I, I call this technique slicing. Do you call yeah. that slicing or do you have a different name for it? There's so many names in our in our craft. I call it talking because okay. basically what you, it's like someone who never shuts up. <laughs> anyway, so I was la, 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 la. this would be someone who stops talking or someone who's just barely talking. So that this is like the mouth never closes basically. Awesome. Never take it's that It's amazing. Part. Like Here's a great shot of the difference between that and that, how that just sits right in. So you created the graduation underneath, draped this over, and then talked it. You convinced it. Yeah. To, to... <laughs> You're going to lay down. You're going to lay down. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I'm kind of dealing with each horizontal section as a panel that's falling down, and I'm taking the edge of the dress or the hem and changing it. I'm shortening it. 
and I'm changing the behavior of it, giving it an attitude adjustment. So it's gonna be more like a finer, softer head of hair. Now, um, I notice that you're also, you kind of pinch it between the- Yes. The, like you're not holding it technically. So does you find that that makes a difference, like kind of pinching it and, and cutting into Absolutely. it? Absolutely, and when I work with people on this technique, Many times we're so used to going like this and picking up a section. They do it automatically. Yeah, don't they? yeah. and it's hard. It, if, if I went and did that, you can see how I would cut a piece much more so than pinching it together and coming in from the side. I'm just getting the side of the piece. It makes more of a tapered effect yeah, know, instead of like sure. kind of a concave on the surface of the hair. And I, I agree. I've, it's a technique I use a lot. And whenever I share it with people, they almost automatically go in between their fingers and I have to say, no, yeah. you know, try this. Yeah. And that pinching changes everything. It totally changes. So again, if you're just joining us, we're working with Ruth Roach, I think one of the most talented hairdressers, well-rounded hairdressers that I know, styling, cutting, everything. We're here for Professionals Who Practice, which is a series that we do with Pivot Point, where we get incredible hairdressers to show how they, they still practice and how important it is to stay on top of your game. So. Ruth, this concept that you're working on here, is it's, uh, how does it work for you? Do you think, okay, I wanna try something, let me get a mannequin, play with it, then maybe take it from there, get a live model, and then do a shoot? Yes. How does your process work? It, it, especially with cutting and color, you know, if you have an idea and you don't have either a virgin head of hair to work on for the color, or you aren't sure if it's gonna work, <laughs> it's a nice way to go about doing that um, and not having to risk you know, working on a real person and not having it work out. And so it's just a great way to develop ideas, to practice techniques maybe that you've seen or you're working on um, so that your comfort level is there when you go to um, do it on a real client. So I just wanna point out here what's happening is as I get to the perimeter, that original section at the hairline, that's where I'm gonna stop my technique so that it's just starting to sit in close to the, the, the uh, line that I cut at the bottom. Ruth, we have a question coming in from Gina Bonds. Yep. She's wondering if you can use uh, this pinch technique on curly or wavy hair. Oh, that's a great, thank you, Gina. That's Gina, Gina. yeah, she's out oh, there. I don't know why I'm looking over there, <laughs> Gina. Um, that's a great, great question, and yes, you can. Um, the idea behind the technique is understanding the fabric that you're working on so that you can, um, know how it's going to react or respond when you let go of that section. So, for example, if I come in here and when we're cutting curly hair, if we're working with the two blades, we're going to close on the section on both sides. So we're going to create more strength in the ends of the hair as opposed to really over softening the ends of the hair, especially if it tends to frizz. So this is a great way to get your length off, to get your ends smaller, just be aware of the fabric that you're working on and know that it's going to shrink up. What's cool about doing this technique too on dry hair is what, if it was curly hair, you'd see exactly what you're getting right as you're doing it. So again, the beauty of what you've done here is that it, it's quite visual for you because you, know, you could do this technique on wet hair, but perhaps you might not see the result as easily. Exactly, and you know, I think if you know someone's hair and you're really comfortable with it and you know exactly how it's gonna move, then that's one thing, but if you're um, not 100% sure how that hair is going to respond, sometimes it's nice to um, go ahead and cut it dry, you know, so you're, you're doing it that way. And so, lots of love coming in, Ruth. I'm going to ask everybody that's watching, um, if you go ahead and hit that share button so all your friends can also get, get a chance to see this. There's a little button in the bottom left corner that says share. If you hit that, all your friends will be notified. And then the ones that are hairdressers can also get this incredible lesson from Ruth Roach, doing some dry cutting and razor cutting, really combining it together. We'd love to hear your questions. We had a great question come in from Gina. We'd love to hear uh, any great questions that you have about hair cutting or the salon industry in general. Please share them with us and I'll, I'll give them a shout out to Ruth. I think one of the things I'd like to say about um, developing your eye. You know, I've, I've heard a lot of people say you can't teach someone to be creative, you know, that it's something that you're born with or whatever, or you can't teach someone how to see hair. And I totally challenge anybody that says that, that it's, you know, you can. You can teach someone. I'm going to prove those people wrong. Well, it, it's truly about exposure, right? Yeah. It's like if you haven't ever seen something, like, you know, 
Hey, I was just a kid from Brooklyn. I started hairdressing at 18, and I had never seen any of the things that I saw. When I did my apprenticeship uh, at Vidal Sassoon and got into the hair world, I started to see things. Yes. And, you know, that changed my whole perception. So do you think that that's what it's about, exposing people to things? As many things as you can possibly expose yourself to is how you want to go about it. And then, okay, so look right here. See how that's, that's dense still? And this is lighter and softer. So what I want to see is this piece behaving more like this hair right here. So I'm going to take that, literally take that piece, I'm going to put my blade right in the center of it, and I'm going to take out a lot of that piece there. Same thing here, blade in the center coming in from the side. So what I'm doing is I'm thinning out this fabric before I go in and cut my perimeter so that I don't end up cutting a perimeter and then having a hard line that I can never get out. So just going in. So doing the internal work first before the outline, would you say that's like a general rule when you want things softer, no matter what uh, you're doing? Yeah, yeah, that's a great point, Gerard, that yes, we want to, um, yeah, exactly what yeah, you even said. Even like a men's haircut, <laughs> if you go in and you, you, know, you go around the ears and you put in a hard line and then you want to kind of taper it out, typically it makes it more difficult. Like if you yeah. do the tapering first and then define the line. That was a, a lesson I learned early as a barber. Yeah, for well, sure. That's beautiful already. Like again, just went in there, sliced through, and then point off the line. It's like a fabric softener, right? We're, <laughs> fabric we're, softener. We're softening the fabric and then going in and putting in the yeah. the structure. You got some great terminology. I love it. You know, because <laughs> especially because we all have something a little different. You yeah. know, and that's one of the things I love. You know, working with experienced educators like Ruth because I get to hear different things. So now I can use that term, fabric softener. Oh yeah. Yeah, whatever helps people to understand and visualize, right? Yeah, and I think a lot of us are visual people in our industry. Absolutely. So sometimes, I mean, the, the science of it is super important, and um, some people really like that part of it and really understanding and geeking out on that, and some people just need to hear the word like windshield wiper, you know, or something like that to describe a movement or a technique. That's the beauty of our craft. It's so many different types of people in it, um, and a great educator does their best to reach all those different people. Yes. I want to do a little recap. Our buddy Jeremy Hickson is watching. What's hey, up, Jeremy? Jeremy? He asked to do a little recap. We're working with Ruth Roach today, one of the, the best educators, most well-rounded hairdressers in the industry. Uh, we're doing our Pivot Point Professionals in Practice series, so you can see she's working on Bridget Marie, this beautiful blonde mannequin. I think the blonde mannequins are great for demonstrating because of the contrast. I can see it, yeah. Technically, Ruth started with a panel in the nape. It was damp, and she did a surface razor cut to kind of collapse it and define the outline. Now working up in horizontal panels using this pinching and kind of freehand technique to whittle that hair in and then going into the outline. I'll let you pick it up there, Ruth, uh, okay. for everyone that's watching. Yep. So you can see if you look from the front how the ends of it are tapered in. So we're working horizontally, which normally builds weight, but we're doing it to create a horizontal line down here and have an even amount of density, but we're working through it freehand more vertically, one piece at a time to take the weight away. So it's got weight and it's light at the same time, which is sort of a contradiction. Ruth, here's a, here's a good question from Jose Rivera. We'd love to hear your take on this. He says, hey Ruth, there are many stylists who would argue that this type of cutting makes the haircut not last long. Is that true? I think that that's great. But great question. I think I think it makes the haircut last longer. Yeah, I happen to agree. You yeah. know, because and the theory is that if the hair is already when your hair grows out, it doesn't grow out in a perfect line. Yeah, it yeah. grows out unevenly, which is what why some people like their hair later. You know, not right after the haircut, but as it's grown for a few weeks. So this is... It's a bit more organic, and that's the way the hair kind of grows. Yeah. But again, guys, you all have to experience things for yourself, yeah. you know? Um, and I, I encourage you to try it. Maybe work with a client who's a little more open-minded and give them a version of this haircut technically, maybe using a perfect square layering and over-direction, and then let them come in the next time and say, hey, I'm going to give you the same look, but I'm going to approach it differently. And then learn for yourself and say, hey, guys, which grew in better? Because uh, the most important thing to be successful is to believe in what you're doing. So if you truly believe in a certain approach and it works for you and your clients, that's amazing. But being open-minded and trying different things will help as well. So perhaps that's the idea. Try it both ways and, and see what the end result is. Yeah. And, and, and 
you know, different strokes for different folks, right? Some people, you know, it depends on the tribe you came from and what, what you were taught. That's what your belief system is. And sometimes we learn new things along the way, a different way of doing something. Well, I think that's interesting, too, because you came from a tribe that was like Trevor Sorby based, very technical but creative at the same time. Yeah. Um, and you've evolved. I mean, would you say that you do things the same way that you did 25 years ago? No. 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 And, and how know, important is that? So important, because otherwise I'd be bored out of my mind, right? right? And it's just uh, ever changing, you know. I, um, I I had something important to say, but it's gone now because I have <laughs> been doing back. hair for 150 years. What do you, what do you call it? Hair space? Hair, yeah, my hair spaceship. The I'm hair spaceship. Hair spaceship. I love that. Well, I'll let so, you get back into your hair spaceship. Now that I'm up to the parietal, up past the parietal, starting to reach the top of the head, I'm going to start working with big vertical sections. And from the point of the perimeter, which is right here, I'm going to go in and work my lengths beyond it. So. I'm doing a similar thing, but now we're up into where the hair is laying on the head, whereas below this, the hair is hanging. So now we're into the laying hair. And if I continue to do that, I'm going to get a lot of weight right here, if that makes sense. So <coughs> I'm dying. No, I'm just well, kidding. we can help you. With I'm that. good. I'm good. No, you I'm sure totally you want some fine. Water? Yep. Okay. Um, so I'm doing kind of what I did at the bottom, but now I'm doing it with elevation. And I'm still working with the same part of the blade and really starting to lighten that up. Rhonda Wagner has a question. She's wondering, does it matter Hi, to you how big the section is that you take when you're doing this method of hair cutting? That's a great question. Thank you for that. And yes, it does matter. If I took too big of a section, first of all, I wouldn't be able to get my shears through it. Um, however, you don't want to be a big chicken and take like one piece of hair at a time because then you can't even see what you're doing because you, you're doing it to take weight out. If that makes sense. So. I hope that answers your question. So would you say they're about like an inch wide? Yeah, yeah. On this particular texture. If I was working on someone with a lot more hair than this, I would... Um, would you take them a little smaller? Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We're a good team. It's a good thing you're here. Yeah. Well, you're doing Otherwise the hard work. I mean, if I was cutting and you were doing the talking, I'm sure that you could... Uh, you know, spill out the words to him. But you know, it, this is an important point. This is a very visual cut. And the way the brain works, you've got the left side and the right side. So you're really working on the right side of the brain right now because it's visual. And that impairs a little bit of um, Your speaking. verbal skills. Your, your verbal skills. Yeah. yeah, that's how the brain actually works. Oh, is it? Yeah, well, that's absolutely. Why. So you just have your client lay on their side while you get in there and get that, that nape cleaned up. So like literally, if it was your client, you'd just have them really tilt their head. Yes. So the idea is that you can get underneath the hair, underneath kind of the, the section of the Underneath here and still keep your shears vertical, you know, so you're not cutting a hard line in there. So you can see, look at the difference, right? And you can start to see the texture in there, but it's not, I'm not going in and cutting big pieces out or anything like that. And so the feeling of this is going to still have like almost more of a one length look as opposed to being really layered. Um, looking and that's sort of the trend is to to not have uh, any short layers in there. Ruth uh, Richard McDade is wondering about prepping the hair was there any particular products that you use or anything when you're doing dry cutting products that you find work better yeah. to prep the hair versus other products? Thank you for that yes prepping the hair is super important and what I've used in her hair is called One United it's by Redkin and it's it's like a almost like a BB cream for the hair, and it's going to give you um, conditioning, it's gonna flatten down the cuticle, it's got heat protection and all that stuff. And then I use Pillow Proof from Redkin, which is a primer. So I've already got some, some products in the hair so that when I go into the rest of it, I gotta move over there, sorry. Um, when I go into the rest of it, we are, my God, spaceship. Come, join me in the spaceship. What was I talking about? You are talking about product. Oh, yeah. So the rest of the products will happen in dry hair. So we do have a, like a layering effect going on and creating that foundation first. So um, uh, we were talking earlier when Ruth came in and we were getting ready, and she gave me some exciting news that you're, you're educating again with the, with the Redkin fam. Yes. So that's, that's wonderful. I know many people would know you from many years working with Redkin. 
So you're back on the on the Redkin Education Circuit and doing things? Yes. Exciting. I'm very excited. You know, it was a long time ago that I was with Redkin, so the, the growth in the company and the the products, the technology, everything else is is huge, you know. So it's fun to be involved now, um, as it was then, because there's been so much change. I get to work with a, a lot um, of artists that I never got to work with and get get really involved in the science of hair again, in the science of hair care. All right, as Ruth does some detailing now, I want to catch you guys up if you're just joining us. I'm Gerard Scarpacey, co-founder of the Hairbrain Community. We're joined today by the incredible Ruth Roach. Hi. And today we're working with the lovely Bridget Marie from Pivot Point. And the whole, this is number 19 in a series that we call Professionals Who Practice. We really wanted to get the message out there that the best hairdressers in the world never stop learning, growing, and practicing. And one of our great partners to help us with that is Pivot Point because they make incredible tripods, incredible mannequins. We want to try new ideas. We want to teach people and eliminate the fear. Hey, we all know it's great to have live models, but imagine you've never done this type of cutting before and Ruth gets a bunch of live models. And let's be honest, if you don't understand it, you can make some holes, you can make some big problems there. It's a much better learning environment we've found to learn new techniques and try them without fear on a great mannequin. And the last thing I want to say about Pivot Point that sets it apart from other mannequins, number one is the quality. It's undoubtedly the best quality hair, the best quality head shapes, but above and beyond that is the fact that they're an ethical company. So if you look into the industry, the hair industry, the mannequin industry, there is a lot of unethical practices and where the hair is sourced from, the factories that the mannequins are made in, sometimes the labor is very unethical. Pivot Point has a global commitment to be an ethical company, so everything that they do is audited. They pay a fair living wage to the workers all over the world, and they pay a fair wage for the hair. So definitely important to support ethical companies. Let's get back into Ruth's incredible haircut. So again, what I'm doing is working with um, taking horizontal sections, but changing the, the behavior, softening the fabric by working with cutting into the hair. One of the things that I wanted to point out that's really um, important, I'll do it when I get to the other side here in a second. Um, while I'm here on this side, you can see that I'm going into it now up into it with the shears. So this is going to give a little more strength to it. So it's softened, softened, softened. Now I'm going to sneak up on it and make strength. So we get some visual texture going on there. Let, got some love coming in from Tammy Reynolds, who used to Tammy! work with you at, at Rare. Yep. One of your stylists in your salon. Hey, Tam Burger. <laughs> She's all the way in the UK. You know, there was a question that came in from Sheila Ash earlier. She said when she tries new techniques like this and changes things up on a client, yeah. Sometimes the clients get fearful or afraid. Do you have any advice, you know, if she's practiced the technique and is ready to try it on a new client, you know, what's a good way for her to go about introducing it? I think that's such a good point because if you've got a client who's a measurer and we all have those, they're like, is this piece a little longer than it? Yeah, it is. Um, it's to educate them on why why it's good to not have their hair, for example, all the same length, you know? Um, I'll say something like, um, I'm not gonna really, I won't say the word, I'm gonna really texturize your hair a lot because a lot of people have had bad experiences with that um, word. And so they might be thinking that's something that it isn't and be afraid. So I would say something like, you're gonna see a lot of longer pieces of hair on the floor but don't freak out. That doesn't mean your layers are getting shorter and shorter. It's that I'm going to change the behavior so there's more movement, so there's more motion. So it looks like you ran your fingers through your hair and it has that beautiful feel to it. So I use words like that as opposed to something technical that only we would understand. As I'm going in here on the section, the, the you can see here is the perimeter right here. From that point, my shears, as I slide past that, my shears are going in about an inch below that point and working my way out and taking some length off so that I am still leaving my length here, but I'm taking weight out about an inch and a half from the perimeter. So that way, it, I'm thinking about it. it. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's technical, um, but it's very visual at the same time. So as Gerard said earlier on, we have to understand the foundation of what hair does and what it likes to do 
to be able to cut visually in the first place. So with, with, with training, you know, we have probably a lot of young hairdressers watching, you know, maybe even in cosmetology school. And if you are a young hairdresser, to me, a young hairdresser is less than five years in the industry. Um, give us a shout out. Let us know how long you've been doing hair. But do you still believe that younger hairdressers really should learn precision, geometric cutting and angles and lines before? Because this is so exciting to do. Yes. Do you think that, you know they can jump right into this, or what's your take on that? In your own salon, how, how did you use to train your assistants? I, we always started with classic precision cutting because you have to know the rules before you can break the rules. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand the physics of hair and what's going to happen to it, that's when you can run into trouble when you get into doing this or recreating it next time the client comes in. You know, it's like this, this particular look, I might not need to do all the stuff I'm doing right now, um, next time to get it looking exactly the same. Does that make sense? I love this because everyone's shouting out how long they've been doing hair. Yeah. We've got our buddy, uh, Matthew Yastrzemski, four years. Hey, buddy. Uh, Nicolette, two years. Matthew, 552 Nicolette. hours left at Cosmo School from Zakaya. You can do it. 11 years from Kerry Lawson, 20 years from Steph, 31 years from Tammy. I'm in my 29th year. How many years are, have you got? 452. <laughs> 452 years. I think years it's like 32 or 33 now. You know, there's one thing that I believe, you know, that hair cutting, hair dressing is a craft. And in crafts, over the thousands of years, there's been like a, a, a plot that people follow. The first part is a, your apprentice. Yes. And it doesn't necessarily mean technically that's your job description, but within your own mind, you know I'm still learning the craft. And I think that, that apprentice phase can take like five to seven years. Again, yes. don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean you should be shampooing hair for five to seven years. Even if you're behind the chair and you have a clientele, you're still in the apprentice mindset of your craft. You're still learning the foundations, the basics, so that it can become instinctual. Then you get on the, what they call a the journeyman phase, which can be from like seven to 15 years, where you actually start creating, like what Ruth is doing now, questioning your foundations and saying, yeah. what if I practice it a different way? Right. And then you become a master, and when you're a master, you really have your own way of doing things. Um, and that's hopefully where we all end up after 15 years or so. That's why so many people are hairdressers for so long, because it never gets boring. Yes. Every head is like a new canvas sitting in front of you with new, a new set of rules, a new set of circumstances that maybe the last client didn't have, but you might be trying to create the same look on a completely different head of hair, you know, completely different texture and all that stuff. So I'm just going to take it off, take a look, take a shake. Looking incredible. So much love coming in from everyone. Um, never stop learning, says Doc Corrigan. So true, it just gets better. Carrie no uh, Noah Lawson loves cutting. Jane uh, Kutchie has been doing hair for 50 golden years. That's incredible. Jane! Uh, Gilda. And you're tuned in, which yeah. is amazing to It me. shows, you know, the passion in our industry. Gilda from Fabulous Cuts has never seen a technique like this before, and she loves it. It's very freeing, you know. Did you say Gilda? Gilda. Gilda? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, Gilda, it's a lot of fun, and it's just such a great way to get the texture and the length cut at the same time. So here's a, a hair question coming in from Fiona Chen. Um, is this technique good for thick and coarse hair? It's the best for thick and coarse hair because you can, it's like we keep talking about fabric, right? And um, fabric softening is like taking corduroy, you know, something strong and stiff like that and making it behave like satin, you know, where you're taking out that stiffness with the technique. So now what I'm going to do is switch back to my razor and I'm using my Samvia um, I don't know the name of the razor. I think it calls it a, ro a roto razor because it rotates. It, yeah, and yeah. I'm not coordinated enough to use that <laughs> aspect of it. I just like the way it feels in my hand. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in with the tip of the blade and start to soften this out. So, now, I noticed that you wet the hair down. So are you a believer that razors should be used on damp hair mostly? Well, it was beaten into me, so kind mm -hmm. of, you know. Yeah. But I also believe that you can... Um, you know, it depends on how you use the razor. And maybe how you prepare the hair. Yeah. You know, yep. if there's something nice and glossy and slippery in it, you might be able to razor dry hair. Yep, for sure. 
<clears throat> so what is the uh, objective right now? Are you kind of it feels like maybe you're going like that French girl bang now. Yes. Too? So I'm going. I'm going to um, work out to a little bit longer of a length, a shorter, um, softer center. Sounds like candy. It's a soft <laughs> center and a crunchy outside. Um, but but sometimes people are calling this like a curtain bang. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you're removing the weight, same idea. You take the weight out first or pre-lighten it and then work from short to long? Yes, I love that word, pre-lightening. That's a great That's word. That's mine. I'll use yours, fabric okay. softening, and you use mine. I love that. Pre-lightening. Yeah, I'm pre-lightening the hair weight-wise so that it's going to sit in nicer when I'm done. So just working out from that shorter middle out to the longer edges. And I've just got my fringe area, the hair that's going to fall naturally into that area, and that's the hair that I'm dealing with. <laughs> so you. here's a great uh, the, the hairdresser's dilemma question coming in from Emily Muncaster. Emily has a question. I have a question. Uh, what do you say to a client uh, when they say, I don't want too much hair cut off, but I want to look different? Um, Bangs! Be open. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Fr a fringe is a big deal. And the, because we're seeing so much fringe happening now, it's an easy sell, yeah. you know, because, um, you know. You know, that, that is the hairdresser's dilemma. We have plenty of clients who are afraid to cut any real length, but of course everyone wants to feel like they have something new and they're part of the trend. So, you know, bangs is a great one. Fringe, whatever name you want to particularly use there, because it's not as much of a commitment. It's just a small area around the face. How about changing your cutting? Like if someone's never had a dry hair cut before and they've always had a bob that was cut technically and you say, well, you know, I can change it up, give you a different feeling in your texture by giving you a dry hair cut. You can yeah. make that client feel excited that they've had something different without taking off too much length. But what do you guys suggest out there? Because Emily is asking the golden question to be really successful behind the chair, you have to make people feel special all the time, even if they don't want a big change. Yeah, even if they're your yeah. one length bob client over and over and over. You know, I've got clients that I've had for 15 years that are, that I'm still doing the same haircut yeah. because that's what they love and they yeah. want it. And some people, you know, that's okay. So but it's important not to take it for granted and still say to them, hey, you know, would you like to try a bang? Yes. Have a great idea for it. Even if they say no, yeah. I think it helps them feel like you care about them. Yes. You know, like you know that maybe they're never going to cut a bang or a fringe, but you say, I've been thinking about your hair and I'd love to give you a longer fringe. And they might say, well, I'm not ready for it now. But you say, okay, great, no problem, but think about it for next time. Yeah. It just makes them I'm feel special. I'm ready when you are. Yeah, exactly. Here's a technical question from Marissa Sun. She's wondering, uh, what factors did you consider when determining how thick the bang should be? Ah, thank you for that. So um, it has a lot to do with the density of the hair, right? and the, the head shape. So right here is where the head changes from having almost a corner on it here at the front to being flat again. So it goes from round to flat. So the hair that I'm working on is the hair that naturally is gonna fall in the fringe area. It's not gonna fall um, on the sides of the head. So just being very aware of that. And I actually sectioned that off when the hair was dry and then I made it, um, then I wet it down and, and clipped it out of the way. So a lot of the determination had to do with the head shape and the hairline and the, tur the turn. So you kind of like picked a point up here and you picked a point yes, here. Yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> a high point. So if I lay the comb on top of the head, where the comb touches the head is the high point. And then from there, I drew a line down to the corner of the eye. So we have that nice separation. You can see that this hair here is going to fall there it's not going to fall on the side and that's really the main reason why we really want to pay attention to that love coming in from our buddy george alderete george. how's it going george we got to get you back in new york and do another facebook live with you georgie okay so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to put a little bit of full frame in which is a light mousse so uh, we just had a question about the mannequin. This is a Bridget Marie mannequin from Pivot Point. This is a beautiful, um, great density of hair, great for practicing hair cutting. These mannequins, these tripods, they're available at pivotpointshop.com. Um, and what's great about Pivot Point is they do monthly sales. You know, because I'm going to be honest, these mannequins aren't cheap, number one, because they're the best mannequins out there. Yeah, the they're best so hair, worth it. And also the ethical practices that Pivot Point employs in making them. So you've got some of these mannequins that are anywhere from, 
$70 to $200, but they do monthly sales. So very often, based on different lengths and textures, you might find a great sale on something like a Bridget Marie, and then you can stock up. So I suggest you get on the Pivot Point mailing list, go to pivotpointshop.com, and keep your eye out for those sales as well, and maybe buy six at a time. All right. So I'm just looking at what's this hair telling me now? Like I cut the hair dry, but <clears throat> I don't want to have it look stick straight. So what I'm doing is going back in with the full frame Redkin, um, and it's a light mousse, and just placing that in the wet fringe, but I'm also placing it in the dry part of the hair I as well. I think this is a great tip, right? Because you can see that you had blown the hair out relatively smooth. You used a round brush on the ends. You used a small Denman wrapping. And that, that, that really helped you cut it. Yeah. But like you don't want it to look so straight when you're done. So you're kind of reverting the texture by using a little bit of mousse so it doesn't wet it, but activates yeah. that. Yeah. And it doesn't make it take longer behind the chair. Because if I were to go and re-wet the whole thing now, I would um, be creating a lot more work for myself. You know, and we're seeing a lot of undone hair. Yeah. But let's be honest, it is still done. Yes. You know, undone doesn't mean they didn't do anything to it. Because Ruth did blow this out to cut it, but now she's reverting it by adding the full frame mousse from Redkin. And you can see how wonderfully that's working. Yeah, and I, I almost just like it like this, this texture, as opposed it's to... Perfect. A, when yeah. you go back to the original, uh, you, what you said, uh, French girl, Yeah. that's it. It's that casually undone look. And it's a hot trend for 2019. The New York Times just bit, did a big article on it really? a, few, a few weeks ago. And I was quoted in the article, and I said, you know, when you do an interview, they, they ask all these questions, and you give them all this information, and then they... They say two things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so I sounded kind of like a jerk. Um, not really a jerk, but I just said, you know, a lob is not a bob. A bob sits above the shoulders mm. or, you know, or higher, and a lob is a cop-out, but then someone pointed out that, hello... You have a lot. Yep. <laughs> so I'm basically wearing the cop out. Um, but, but again, this is like the new trend of people getting brave and cutting their hair short. So, do, do, you know, again, whether people might not realize it, but in the past 20 years or so, um, the hair cutting services in salon have suffered a bit. Yes. The actual dollar amounts. Uh, because the trend has really been long hair. And a lot of the money has been generated from color, which is great. It's just a fact of how things have gone. And we've constantly been waiting for some kind of movement of cutting to come back in. Yeah. So are you saying that the New York Times is predicting that people will be cutting more? I hair? sure hope so. I hope so, too. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. think so. I think we've had the long, nondescript Supermodel hair, yeah. long layers, kind of face framing, which is a beautiful thing. But let's be honest, a haircut like this, even conservatively, someone's going to need it at least four times a year. Yes. But sometimes a long layer with just a face frame, they might need to cut only twice a year, and that they're coming in for color four times a year. So if they have a right. cut like this and color, we're going to see more dollars hit the bottom line, um, and that's important for us to, to make money. You know, Jared, I want to point something out here that I did. I, I took the nozzle off of my blow dryer, and I've probably done that like two times in the last 10 years. <laughs> and the reason that I did is that I, I, I would love to be using a diffuser and I'm just gonna out myself, I don't have one with me. So what this is doing is instead of it blasting the air with a concentration, uh, it's just, I mean blasting the hair, it's just giving me enough um, of a diffusion so that I can go in and create some texture there. I've got it on high heat but low blow, if that makes sense. Ruth, there's been so much love coming in, and I, I do want to point out lots of people that are watching, after we're done here today, this video is saved forever on our Facebook page. You go to Hairbrain on Facebook, you go to our video section. At this point, we've, brought, we've got 19 of these professional who, professionals who practice, where you can actually get the same mannequin and do the same exact lesson. We've got over 350 classes all together, live models, men, women, curly hair, uh, everything you can, you'd ever want. And you can go back and watch those at any time. If you want to get a little bit more in-depth, you can also head to our website, hblive.me, where we've got full online courses. Um, that's a pay-per-view kind, of kind of class, 
but it takes the whole experience to another level. You've got an incredible sale happening there now where you can buy all eight classes from 2018 for only $228. That's over 40 hours of incredible education from some of the best mentors in the world. Or you can always go to our Facebook page and tune in to these free classes that we do. So Ruth, it looks like you're encouraging that movement on the ends. Yeah, and just like taking the hair and bending it and letting the heat go into the, where the bend of the hair is. You can see how that just gives us a little bit of an undulation in the hair and creating a little less organized version of what I could do with an iron. This would also be great just working with an iron um, and creating that, <clears throat> excuse me, movement on top of this. So if you were, especially in a rush, you know, you can just hit it with an iron. I was talking with Ruth earlier about, you know, as educators, sometimes you go into new classes and perhaps the salon or whoever saves money by getting a, a cheaper mannequin, oh. um, which sometimes you can get away with the cutting, but you can almost never get away with the styling. Right. What you'll notice here is these great pivot point mannequins, because of the quality of the hair, you can actually style them. <clears throat> and really have a full learning experience. So even if it's 10 or 15 or $20 more, you get so much more out of the class. I'm a true believer in that. Really worth going the extra mile and getting a quality mannequin so you can get the most out of your lesson. I mean, Ruth, this is just so beautiful and so appropriate. Um, I think so many people are saying, oh, thank you so much for this lesson. It's exactly what I needed. Okay. Can't wait to practice again and again. Uh, I think you nailed it as always. And it's looking I think incredible. I'm done. Yeah. Any final words to say to your adoring audience? <clears throat> what do you think of my glasses? Oh, your glasses are <laughs> chill. They're amazing. Um, no, thank you so much. Remember to to trust your eye, learn to develop your eye because you can. And if you already do do that, that's awesome. Um, <clears throat> and and just believe in yourself as an artist. You know, learn the basics, know the basics, but also be able to. Um, <clears throat> Be free with the hair and let it talk to you. I want to thank you all for tuning in. I want to thank the incredible Ruth Stop. Roach. I learned so much. I had so much fun watching and learning for her. The luckiest hairdresser in the world. Hey, guys, if you're coming to IBS in New York City, don't forget, on March 10th, we've got the Craft Hairdresser Party of the Year. Oh, my God. Yep. I'm coming. Yep. Sunday, yep. March 10th, the Hairbrain Video Awards. We've got an amazing club here in New York. Anyone, even if you're not coming to IBS New York, if you can make it to New York on Sunday, March 10th, you're going to love the party. Thank you to Pivot Point for the continued support of this incredible um, program. And peace out, everybody. We'll see you real soon. Thank you.